episode of Colubrid and Colubroid Radio. As always, Zach is here and Clint is as well. How you doing, man? Good, my friend. Good, my friend. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well because it is finals week, which means that I have – it's Monday, so I have four more days, and um, this insane semester is put to bed, which is which is going to be a good thing, but a lot of good was accomplished in it, so, you know, I'm not going to complain, um, but uh, I might want to. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, but yeah, no, that's that. Um, just to give everybody an update right off the bat, this is – one of our Just Clinton and I episodes, uh, we have had quite a few people reach out over the past, I would say, year. Uh, I feel like it was like once every three or four weeks, somebody would say, are you ever going to do a Carinata episode? <laughs> that would be the King Rat Snakes. And um, we kept this one in our back pocket because we don't. We can get a guest, don't get me wrong, but I, I, I think uh, Clint here has kept more than one. Carinata. In fact, I believe when I was standing at your table at Tinley, you sold a trio to someone and they were heading yeah. for something and yep. blah, blah, blah. So this is going to be an episode where basically I interview Clint on how to keep Carinata. And then we're going to talk a little bit about um, just some fun aspects of the King Rat Snake, if you don't know what Carinata is, um, also known as the Stinking Goddess, which is one of the best alternative <laughs> common names out there. And we'll talk about why it has that name, I'm sure, when we get to it. But um, this is a species of snake that's actually uh, – I don't want to say that it's farmed at a commercial level, but about as close to commercial as you can get with farming snakes in China. So we'll discuss that element uh, of, of Carinata in addition to the way we keep them in classic – culture, and we'll cover morphs and husbandry and, and all that. And that'll be the second half of the show. Uh, but the first half is just going to be a little bit more banter than normal between Clint and I. Uh, <laughs> and we're, we've got our science update now, which I'll be doing, and, and Clint will be talking about the market. So this is just going to be a fun, laid-back show, not quite as uh, – not that the other ones are intense. That's probably the wrong word. But uh, just, just a chill, fun episode because I think Clint and I are both in a position for something chill – Right now. So, Absolutely. so yeah, uh, Clint had some surgery last week. <laughs> you, <laughs> yes, you I did. Talk a little bit about that because it yeah. may pop up in the episode when the, 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 very, awkward very true. silence and he's laying on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> so I, oh. uh, I had a, uh, some, a surgery on uh, my sinuses and it's a surgery. I actually had the same thing done 10 years ago. Uh, so if I do sound a bit nasally in this episode, please forgive me. Um, I, you know, it's funny is I had it done on Thursday and, you know, Zach and I were planning on what day we were going to record. And, and I told him I could, I think I'm gonna be fine Friday. Yeah. If you, if you want to do it Friday, we can do it. And then we decided, well, we'll go ahead and schedule it Monday. And oh my gosh, I'm glad that we did that because <laughs> I, I thought that I was going to bounce back and no buddy, I, clearly I'm no. 10 years older than what yes, I was last time I got this. Mm -hmm. Uh, because yeah, it, it felt like a truck ran me over it and I'm still not a hundred percent. Um, before we started recording, I told Zach, I said, okay, I've been feeling off for about three hours now. And if, uh, if I feel like I'm going to go down because the problem now it's, I can breathe and that's fantastic, but yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, big win. Uh -huh. Um, but because of all the cutting in there, there's swelling, there's high pressure in my head. I'm a little foggy. Things like that. So, uh, you know, yeah, I told Zach, if I feel like I'm going to black out, I'm just going to signal you and I'm going to lay down for a second. Don't don't uh -huh. panic. Just just let me do my thing. I'll be back and we'll pick up from there. So um, but uh, yes, but I'm if, good. If, We're here. Yeah. <laughs> if we go to radio silence, y'all know why. Uh, so anywho, so that's that. And then on a yeah, on a more personal level to us and our network, um, Colubrid and Colubrid Radio would just like to send our condolences to the pod father, uh, Mr. Eric Burke. Um, unfortunately, Eric's mother passed away over the past month. That's why there's been a little bit of a delay in uh, putting up episodes. And I am, I'm, I'm pretty much, I, I would say I'm de demanding understanding on this one. A couple people Absolutely. messaged y'all did know I get it. You know, when's the next episode coming up? Well, we wanted to give Eric his time because Eric, does all the editing he does all the posting and, and if it wasn't for eric uh we wouldn't be here so um just from the colubrid side of the network 
uh, we wanted to to send our condolences and, and thank Eric for everything he does for us because we would not exist without him. So absolutely, big shout out there, Eric. Sorry yeah. from the both of us. Yep. So, um, kind of moving on with our show, uh, just our updates. My big update, obviously, is um, I've got two biggies. The first one is semester's coming to an end. Uh, I have I, I set out at the beginning hoping to put out seven graduate students, have them all defend their theses, and uh, that was it. Was kind of like you in that surgery. Uh, where you're like, oh, yeah, I could do that. And now you're at the end and you feel like you got hit by a truck. Uh, each one of those students produces a document that on the short ends, 80 pages. On the long end, I had a hundred or I had a couple 160 page plus theses. Um, and uh, we have to review that. And I admittedly put more time into some than others. Um, but uh, my last one is this Friday. And it's a uh, it's actually one of the one of the projects that I've been talking off and on about with the show since Pay started their thesis, which is this is the uh, indigo snake sausage study. Yes, yes. So a lot, I learned a lot about snake nutrition uh, with this thesis and, and, and Pay did a, a great job. And I can't wait for them to defend this coming Friday. It's going to be a pretty cool uh, uh, moment. I, I don't I'm not. A couple people, when they get to the defense, I'm kind of like, okay, we'll see how this goes. Uh, I don't feel that way with pay. Pay definitely put their time in, and, and it's going to be a good one. So um, nice. that'll be a great way to end the semester. Uh, and then we've started projects out the wazoo here at the university. I have a really big false water cobra. Um, well, I have a, I have a – how do I say this? How do snakes heat themselves study? Uh, that involves false water cobras. So we're we're testing about 18 animals with belly heat and then 18 animals with hal- heat from halogens. And it took us forever, but we've normalized the room. So the amount of heat that the animals are getting is about as close to equal with the two. And then we're studying everything. We had the uh, one of the veterinarians from the Philadelphia Zoo came on campus and did blood draws on all of those snakes to get a baseline. Um, so we're going to be looking at all the kind of classic blood levels that you look at. Uh, we're going to be looking at growth with the two different heating strategies. Uh, my students are going in four times a day, and they just snap a picture of the animals. And then we have an ethogram where we're looking at how, what behaviors are they exhibiting throughout the day? Are they heating themselves differently? And uh, as a teacher, there's there's nothing better than when your student comes up to you all nerding out and excited and we have like three weeks of data and they already have found a statistical significant difference in behavior between the two strategies of heating. I don't know what it is. I just know that there's something going on. So that's cool. Uh, that's awesome. So yeah, on, on that end, things are good. And then my other biggie is it's brumation time. So the infamous corner, um, it was weird. It, we had a quick year, man. Uh, <laughs> yes. yes i was standing in my garage about a, three weeks ago and i was like it's cold down here and i i don't know what the hell i didn't even realize like it's thanksgiving i was like oh everybody's got to go down and i had you know i'd stopped feeding them and all that but the reality of this didn't hit so i fortunately have the collection at home is down um most of the snakes at school are down. I bought a bunch of pit tags because we now have so many hognose snakes that I need to actually pit tag them to keep track of the track of them. Um, mm-hmm. So once they get their pit tags in, which I think is happening Wednesday, uh, they're going to come to the house and go down. Um, so I am looking forward, though, to everybody being down and having a couple months of no food. I still have my grow outs at home and, you know, there's still plenty. I'm sure you have plenty of snakes that need to eat. Oh, yes. Um, oh, yes. Mm-hmm. But, but, you know, the reprieve, it'll be nice. But really, that's that's it for me. I don't really have anything else. I've had quite a bit going on. Um, <laughs> so, obviously, we had Black Friday, and I'll talk about yeah. that a little bit more once we get to uh, the marketing piece. But uh, that there was a lot of prep that went into that. And, I mean, then there, then there was the actual event, and then there was everything that you had to try to do to clean up after something that uh-huh. large. 
Um, but some cool things that are going on. Uh, well, just like you, it's time to start putting some stuff down. So we only just stopped feeding last week. So I still have another, you know, week to two weeks that we're emptying guts and, and all that and actually dropping temps down significantly. Um, and looking forward to that. Um, yeah. Not because it's it's necessarily me that's taking care of, you know, that uh, large, uh, you know, large collection at this point, but then it opens up some of my, you know, staff to be able to, okay, now here's some other projects that we can yeah. turn you loose on and, and get ahead of. Um, and also, you know, watching that feed bill <laughs> diminish for a mm-hmm. couple of months because, wow, yeah, um, it's up there. Um, but so, so that's happening. Uh, something cool, and I, I've talked about it, you know, every show is I always bring up the gray bands, right? You know, yep. how I'm doing with the gray bands. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I want to say a big shout out to, to two of our former guests. Um, you know, we already talked about Jason Hood and the quail, mm-hmm. and, and that kicked in a good amount of uh, the gray bands to start feeding. And then I also got some, um, some skins, uh, shed skins that. from Chad uh, Gorman, I'm sorry, Gordon, and um, that I would say at this point, at least 80% of the gray bands have to oh. between those two. And, and then, you know, the anoles, the gecko skink and all that. But uh, it, it was just really exciting to see, you know, how many we've got going. And, and I told uh, Drew, who takes care of the nursery, I said, you know, it, it's because we've lost a couple that didn't eat. Yeah. You know, it's, it's part of it. And I told him, I said, you know, I'm, I'm excited for next season. Because we have so many more tools in our belt to mm-hmm. be able to start right off the bat, you know, with all these that I think we're going to have even greater success than what we're already having, you know, with them. So yeah. um, that's that was really cool. And that's really exciting, you know, to see um, another cool thing that I'll, I'll mention. And this isn't colubrid related, but um, green killed lizards. I don't know if you're familiar with them. I may not they're, be familiar with them. They're like miniature green tree monitors. Huh. And so they they have a monitor personality, but you know they're 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 much smaller. Their bodies, I don't know, I want to say are like six to eight inches, um, you know, but a long tail. Uh, really cool. You can get them to be real social if you you work with them. Uh, we've got a female who's about to drop some eggs, and I'm just ah, that's, that's really cool. cool. You know, a new species, uh, you know, here at the shop that we're working with. So, um, so that was really neat. Um, but yeah, it, it's I think at this point, you know, for us, it's we we've got some new product in that we're going to be setting up uh doing some cage adjustments like i have a a holdback room and a nursery room and mm-hmm. we're going to eliminate the holdback room combine it into the nursery and then i can turn that holdback room into an arid room more for the oh, cool. species um so that'll be a winter project you know that we're working on now um and and it's kind of the thing and really i'm late to the game on doing this but normally about the beginning of November is when I would start business planning for the following year and what we want to accomplish, what timelines on different things we want to do, roll out. And I just started that this week. And really the beginning of that is looking back at the previous year yep. and where the cycles were and what we want to do. So, so that's really what what's going on in my world right now is all of that. And, um, it, it's exciting. It, it's, it's neat. To, uh, you know, I, well, you know, we, we nerd on the numbers, we nerd yep. on the planning, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. And so I'm excited to get to do that at this point. Th- this is your first complete year though, right? Correct. Correct. So, I mean, it's, I think that's why I delayed a little bit and, you know, really starting to do it. Um, and it, it's, it's good to have that full year picture, yep. you know, and to see, and it's, it's cool because although it's the first year we did open in August of uh, 22 and the trends did remain the same from all, from 22 and 23. Um, although, I mean, you know, at a much elevated, you know, yep. higher elevated level in 23, but it was, uh, it, it's cool to see that, okay, those are going to more than likely be the trends. And so how we want to react and respond and prepare to ensure that we deliver what's expected of us, you know, during those moments throughout the year. So, no, that, that's, that's awesome. And, and not to go back to the gray bands, but I, I feel that victory because for multiple episodes now, I've, you all can't see the expression on <laughs> Clint's face when he mentions Alterna, 
but it's <laughs> it's like there's a little bit of hate there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's climbing the mountain and getting yeah. to the top. It is exciting. It's it's uh-huh. it's probably for me the the biggest um, animal win of the year. Mm-hmm. You know, yep. is is being able to to flip with a lot of those. So so very very happy in that regard. So just curiosity wise, did 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 y'all like stick the skin on the pinky or did you make a slurry or, or what actually so ended I, up I've, working in the end? I've done both. Um so <laughs> I I took a Knowles and made a slurry. I took house geckos and made a slurry, a skink and made a slurry, and I think that's yeah, that's all my slurries. Um mm-hmm. and the, then I have um some actual quail and I have the skins that Chad sent uh, of the um, fence lizards. And so what I've – I've tried a few different ways. And typically we are taking frozen pinkies. I am having them washed with Dawn soap just because I figured it can't hurt. Yep. You know, to, to get more mm-hmm. rodent smell out of there, it can't hurt. And also it, if you're washing those in just room temperature or lukewarm water – by the time you're done washing them, they're ready. They're, they're yeah. thawed. It thaws very quickly when you do that. Um, so we're ensuring that they're dry. And then we have dipped them in the slurry. With the quail, I've actually cut a little piece of down off mm-hmm. of you know uh, one quail and kind of put it on the pinky like a little hat. <laughs> so it's got a little toupee on, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've done the same thing with the skin from the uh, fence lizards. And uh, we, we're having very, very good success. And occasionally um, I will – we've done it with live as well just to see if, okay, maybe they need a little movement to stimulate. And I mean – but most that are taken are taking the frozen thawed whatever it's scented, you know, with whatever it is that they're after. So, and I think that that's probably whatever, uh, I, I, here's something I've noticed about some tiny colubrids. When you're dealing with babies that hatch out tiny, they're not really ferocious, you know, for the most yeah. part. And so I think that a lot of times frozen thawed actually is a better starter for them because they're more apt to go after it because it doesn't move and scare them. And yeah. where, you know, a lot of other times it's like, well, if it's not eaten, it wants live. It doesn't want frozen. But with babies, I think it can be the other way around. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the success is, is certainly jumping. And it's not just with them. This is working with we had a, f- a handful of Nablocci that wouldn't yeah. eat. Most of them have just took off right out of the gate. But we have maybe three or four that didn't. Um, there's like a cow king that hadn't eaten. There's um, even a Chinese beauty rat that hadn't eaten. And the skins, boom, 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 boom. I just was pulling tubs yeah. before we hopped on. And, oh, you, well, you ate, you ate, you ate. Um, so it's great. And I think I'm going to try it with uh, 100 flower snakes, Mollendorf. Nice. I've got some of those that uh, they haven't kicked in for us. And I'm going to try one week. And, and <laughs> if that doesn't work, they're going down. Like I'm going to yep. put them under for the, <laughs> for the season because uh, I just – it's – I would have put them under earlier, but I just didn't have the cooling ability And so I'm like, "Uh, you guys are losing more weight than what I want, you know, so uh, but we're going to give it a shot and see if it works with them. And I mean, it's it's worked with a variety of species, both king and rat already. So figure we'll see what happens. Yeah, I I have one more fun update that I I do want to talk. This all reminded me of it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I had a day about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. I don't remember when it was, but. I basically was having a day here at the school. Uh, <laughs> I had some meetings where I had – I don't know how to say what I'm trying to say. My, I remained professional, but I walked to the line. <laughs> <laughs> how about that? <laughs> oh, I love it. And I, I was coming – walking down the hallway, and I know I've had – it's been a day when, like, the Red Sea is parting in front of me as I am walking. I'm not small, um, and I, my RBF is wicked. So everybody was just like, <laughs> "Get out of his way!" So I was like, "Okay, I gotta, I gotta calm this down." Um, so I, I had some empty XOs, um, and they were the the, the nice sized X, XOs, the ones I don't know what they're called. The, the shorts, they're they're right here next to me. They're only like a foot tall 
So they're mm-hmm. not like the gecko kind, but and I small mediums. Yeah, small medium. And I I made my mind up. Like those are going to be naturalistic hognose snake tanks. So when they came in, somebody actually donated them to the school, and uh, I saw them on a table and was like, "Mine!" And I just grabbed them, mm-hmm. brought them in here, and I'd been meaning to set them up for hogs because I'm going to be starting the book next year, and I I like having the animal that I'm writing the book about like right here oh, while yeah, I'm working. Yeah. It reminds me I can see them doing things. It helps me, you know, learn. So. And I was basically like, I'm doing this today because I'm going <laughs> to kill someone if I don't. Like, that was, <laughs> that, was that was it. It was like a bit of, bit you of know. meditation for you, uh-huh. right? Uh, yeah. So I had, if, if y'all remember, we went to Colorado. Um, and the last day we were at Colorado uh, looking for the hogs in their habitat, um, I – Swung by Lowe's because the the students drove from West Virginia out, all the way out there. Uh, I bought three five gallon buckets. I bought a shovel, and then I went right to where we were finding them and dug, brought back fifteen gallons of sand. Nice. Um, and you know, in habitat, bits and pieces of old sagebrush and stuff. Most of the stuff was up by the road because, as an ecologist, there was a part of me that was like dying on the inside if we took it out of the good habitat. So anyway, I had all that, and I've been meaning to set up these vivaria, almost like a biotope. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I did it. And so you know, I got done, and I'm looking at them, and I'm like, that was fun. I don't want the world to burn now. All's well. And I had these two hogs at home that I was raising. Um, one was and, – and they're like – I don't have that many morphs, but these were morphs. One was an Evans hypo female, and one was, I think – con an arctic of some persuasion i don't even know what it is it's just got the pattern of an arctic and so i threw them into the vivarium and um i now find myself staring in the vivarium more than talking to people (laughs) because they did exact like it was amazing to me within 10 minutes of them being in there they went under the sand like And uh, it's like a it's like a hognose snake ant farm, which is the coolest thing on earth, because they'll be under the sand. They look like the worms from Doom, <laughs> Dune. Like you see the sand moving, yeah, and you're like, yeah. okay, that's where they are. And then the the um, Arctic will actually go up against the glass under the sand. So I've actually watched it like moving through the sand, and it just like it did exactly what it was supposed to. It calmed me down. It made me think. Because when we were out in the field, like I, I, I've read that they live underground. They use this, I, but until you're out there in it, you don't realize how much they do that. And I don't know of all that many people keeping hogno snakes on sand. I know that there are people that if I said I keep my hogno snakes on sand, they would probably spontaneously combust with rage because sand is like the worst substrate to keep a reptile on. Yet quite a few species evolved to live alongside it, and so um, but it it it. It inspired me. So now at the university, uh, we, I have a hundred plus Zusai majors, um, and uh, I'm basically put out a call to all my students, like who wants to help me do this heterodon stuff. So we're going to be doing a study um, with exos where I'm going to set them up where it's basically sand and then aspen because they both burrow, and I just want to see like is aspen like. If you give them the choice, will they go to mm. the sand or the aspen? Do they go as frequently to aspen right. as they do sand, sand versus aspen? I just thought, you know, that's a fun project. Um, but I can't say enough things about keeping the snakes this way. It's been really, really cool. Uh, the only thing I do do, I don't feed them in there. I'm sure I could. Uh, but I these two hognose snakes are like dogs. Um they they don't hesitate to eat. Uh, so I just literally have them like slithering around this desk eating their mice so they don't ingest too much. Then I just plop them right back in. Uh, but other than that, that's been – that was just a fun little aside. Uh, that, so, that, you know, yeah. with your – the study that you're going to do on <laughs> our – because I know that before you had mentioned how um, reactive they are to UV. Uh-huh. 
And are you are you putting UV on them? Is that going to be part of what you're working with? What we're going to do is I'm going to try to parse out as many of these husbandry attributes as possible. So there's going to be a dedicated UV study. There will be the, the, the substrate study. Mm-hmm. We're going to try to do um, food. So I want to do like hair. I, I want to do this thing. Um, I just forgot the name of it because it's. Monday of finals week. Basically <laughs> you feed them like a white mouse and then you write down the time and then you religiously check their enclosure for poop. Mm-hmm. And then you look and see like when the poop comes out, it'll be white cause it's a white mouse. And then you can track how long it stays in their system. Okay. Sure. And that has everything to do with temperature and stress. And like, there's a right, lot right. of confounding variables. Um, but you can do the same thing where, uh, you feed them like a hairless mouse. And I just want to see if that time from food to poo and then the consistency of the poo, if that matters, and if you see a response in growth. Because uh, one neat thing about the plains hognose snake is if you actually – like everybody knows they eat toads. That's mm-hmm. you know, uh, that's a well-known heterodon fact. But there are populations of Nasicus, the the plains or Western or whatever you want to call it, where a fairly large percentage of their diet is actually rodents. Um, A gig push is 60 percent and can actually be the dominant prey item. But when you say dominant in 2023, that means the prey item. Right. But, you know, there's still like 40 percent that's frogs, toads. Um, turtle eggs, they eat a lot of turtle eggs, uh, lizard eggs. And then there's this thing uh, called assimilation. Um, not a, Oh, my God. Assimilation energy, assimilation frequency, assimilation something, where it's basically like if you eat a steak, what percentage of that steak becomes you because you're made of protein versus if you eat an orange, what percentage of that orange becomes you because it's made of – it's not high in protein. Your body has to use – just as much energy so you get a bigger boom big, bigger bang for your buck eating a steak than you do an orange sorry vegans so <laughs> <laughs> so uh um so when you feed you know the snakes the mice one thing that i've often thought about is that hair is really what the issue is because they can't digest it mm-hmm. um can i could i do like a, a legitimate energetic study yes i don't want to do that nobody cares like I'm sure there's someone listening who cares for that, but that is a bunch of math and that's not like fun. And, you know, but I can, I can track how long it takes from eating a mouse to crapping that we can do. Um, so uh, I'm going to do stuff like that, but, but no, I'm, I'm, that's one of the things I'm most excited about with 2024 is that I finally get to like pull the trigger on this hog nose snake stuff. Um, I've been dancing really- around it. So, yeah, that, that's really cool. I, I want <laughs> we'll talk more about the UVB in a little bit because mm-hmm. there's something that we're going to chat about. But I, uh, before we move past it, I, I want to talk about the sand for just a yes. second and, and impaction, because mm-hmm. that's that, that's what you know, you're referring to that. Yeah. If you post a picture of, you know, your bearded dragon on sand mm-hmm. on, in a Facebook group, you're going to get flamed. And and maybe I'm going to get flamed for, for what I'm about to say. But here's my belief on it. As you said. There are so many reptilian species <laughs> out there that live on sand. <laughs> yes. And was impaction a problem? It was. But it was also – when you, we talk about, for example, I'm going to use bearded dragons because that's the big one that yeah. is really debated on. Impaction was a problem 20 years ago, even 15, 30. If it's, an, if it's a problem today – it's not because of the sand. It's because of the husbandry. Yep. And that's why it was a problem 30 years ago is we didn't know how to take care of them and provide them what they needed to be able to go through their natural functions and process the sand that they naturally ingest in the wild you know, as well. So it's if we are providing the proper temperature gradient and basking spots – if we are providing the proper amount of calcium, D3, variety of food, um, so nutrients you know, in general, if we are providing the proper UVB in their basking spots, 
then the sand that they would ingest when they are eating in nature will pass, you know? Yeah. And now that's also, so I'm a full believer of that, but I also believe it has to be sand, not any of the fabricated mm-hmm. mock sand, you know, calcium sand, any of that stuff. No, if you're using real sand um, and so I'll give it a product name. So it's either like the play sand. If it's completely clean, mm-hmm. that should be okay. Or repti sand is natural as well. But once you start getting into the calcium and all that, no, I, you know, I buy the sand. I don't want any of that. Yeah. But as long as it's that, I have had zero issues on anything we oh, keep yeah. on it, you know, whatsoever. Now, when it comes to beardies, we'll put baby beardies on solid substrate. But as soon as they get a body length of about five to six inches, we set them on sand or a sand mixture of some sort if we're going bioactive and we have had no problems whatsoever. So yep. I, I'm with you, Zach. I just feel that it's <laughs> – while it does have some truth behind it, it's it's outdated truth if that yeah. makes sense. Well, so. the, the two things that seemed to really drive it was a lack of hydration mm-hmm. because people think that animals in the desert back in the day, it's desert so they don't need water all the time and in reality – A lot of species that live in desert systems actually are finding microhabitats that are loaded. Mm -hmm. Loaded might be a loaded term. Um, Mm -hmm. Have more relative humidity and moisture associated with them than other environments that they're in. And so if they're going to be bringing in the moisture, which is going to keep their systems flowing, (laughs) to use the word goes moisture, and then the temperature. But if, if they if you get those two things out of whack, which a lot of you know, we were doing back in the day, mm-hmm. if you don't get the animal hot enough, it, but you're giving it moisture, it's not going to be able to reach that physiological max to keep the things going. Mm-hmm. And if you, um, you know, get it hot enough, but it doesn't have enough water, uh, you're going to have a problem mm-hmm. there. But if, if you keep all that going, all will be well. But no, it's this is one of my ranty soap boxes in my herpetoculture class in the lab we go what we i can actually talk about substrates for three and a half hours straight and and we get to the sand and i love it i set a trap i felt like there are teachers listening (laughs) we're allowed to set traps (laughs) and so i'll put up the 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 sand image and it has appeared a dragon by the way and then i say okay what's wrong with this picture and then you know i they all start saying what they've heard on youtube or or seen then there's also students in the class that are like looking at me like there's nothing wrong in that picture which is kind of fun and then i invariably say nothing if the husbandry is right and then we go off on this great big tangent the one thing i will say which i'm going to do this as well um this sand from from colorado is its texture and feel uh it, it it does not have the same texture and feel as play sand i'm not saying that you can't use play sand <laughs> I'm simply saying that there, it, it doesn't have the same. And one of the things with with my crayfish research, I study burrowing crayfish a lot, which are the ones that dig the holes. Mm-hmm. So uh, by pure association of them being in the ground, I have all these different mechanisms of figuring out percent sand, silt, clay, and what kind of soil are they in and um, uh, all that kind of jazz. And I have every intention next January when – I get this group of students rolling with the header on stuff. That's the first thing we're going to do. We have a whole bucket of this soil from Colorado where I'm just going to figure out what it is, for lack of a better word. I mean, it's obviously sand, but what kind of sand? And yes, there are different types of sand. And I also understand that Nassicus's range is from like Alberta all the way down to Kansas. There's a lot of soil there. Uh, But I just know that this particular type of soil – this is what matters. So anyway, okay. Well, that is that. Um, should we want to get to our updates? Yeah, absolutely. If you want to jump in, start with the, I mean, we're kind of in that science discussion right yeah, now. Sure. So if you want to keep rolling with it, let's, uh, yeah. let's hear what you got, big guy. Okay. So um, I'm actually going to talk about a paper. Uh, a paper came out early No, I don't know when it was. was Sometime last week. And last week was the last week of November. uh, And it's a great paper. It's open access. I'm going to share it to the Facebook page. So um, if you haven't been to our Colubrid and Colubroid 
Radio Facebook page, please like that page uh, because that's where we're going to we're going to start using the page more. And this is one of our first attempts at that. But if you are a snake nerd, you will know this name, Dr. Harry Green. Uh, he is probably one of the one of the most active um, snake researchers on the planet. He wrote a book, and I think it was 1997, which is called Snake, the Mystery of Evolution or something like that. And it's kind of a standard issue snake book that almost everybody that has snakes has. And uh, the title of this paper, he also wrote, his co-author is a guy named Kevin Wiseman, Dr. Wiseman, um, who was his former student. But the title of the paper is Heavy, Bulky, or Both, What Does Large Prey Mean to Snakes? And what this paper is, is it's what's called a review paper. So they essentially go into the literature and – get all these fun papers on all snakes. This is not just colubrids. This is elapids, pythons, worm snakes, natricids, uh, dipsatids. Nerodia even has a, a a big, you know, series of pictures in it. And they, they talk about this idea called mass bulk theory, which is this kind of fun relationship that you have with what we call gape limited predators, which are predators that have, you know, the, the prey that they feed on, is, is limited by the size of their mouths and snakes, even though they can disarticulate their jaws and feed on very large prey items, they can't disarticulate a prey item. Um, they don't chew it up like we do. Uh, and, and I know there's someone listening. Yes. I know that there are homolopsids that rip the claws off of crabs. Um, but that's the exception, not the rule. So um, this paper, you know, I've only had time to read the abstract and skim it. So I can't really, you know, dive into the nitty gritty details, but I know it has a direct correlation to keeping snakes because it's literally talking about what is that upper threshold of something a snake can eat. Uh, and I find that I don't know why I do this, but with the king snakes, I, for some reason, just love pushing that threshold. Um, it's not good for them. It's not good for me, but I find that like I've got a little yearling Florida king at home or Cali King, and I'll have like a large fuzzy or a small adult mouse. And I'll be like, you know, let's just see what happens. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, interestingly, the Florida Kings can handle it. The Cali Kings cannot. Uh, yep. that, that's been an interesting observation. But, uh, but, but this is kind of getting into that. And then they talk about the whole risk reward when you feed on, you know, a larger prey item and you're able to actually dispatch it. Uh, you know, the reward is you don't have to hunt as much now. The risk is you are immobile for longer now. So what does that mean? Is there like a a size threshold where the snakes make that decision? So that's in there. They also talk about um, this whole idea of bo- the snake body size relative to its prey. Uh, and, and what role does that have to, to do with snake feeding choice? So – I don't know. I just thought it was a really cool paper. And the other and, and the other thing that, that's nice about it, one of the things I love about Dr. Green's writing, and, and he he has a couple of books out there that are awesome, is that he he and I, I this is something near and dear to my heart. He has a PhD, but you can't tell in his writing, and that's not an insult. It makes it so that anybody can consume his writing. And I feel like you're having a much bigger impact. If you can hit that audience, like Mm -hmm. if if a PhD with all this fancy training can understand it, and if somebody just loves snakes can read it and understand it, you're doing great things. And so um, that's this paper. But that that's my my bit. It's a it's a beast. Um, This thing is. Let me look real quick. I'm holding it as we speak here. Three fifty six two. Yeah, it, it's solid 15 pages. So, Excuse me. but yeah, no, that's that's my contribution. And that's a good one. I completely agree with you on if he's able to put it in terms where everyone can understand it. I've often said whenever I'm training a team to mm-hmm. interact with the public, um, I use the scenario that if you think back to when you were in high school or college, whatever you happen to go to, and uh, think about the smartest person in the building, the smartest teacher, smartest professor. Is that the one that had the greatest impact on you that you remember the most from? And usually it's not. And it's Mm -hmm. because there's one that was able to communicate better. 
and yep. got deeper. It, it was able to, you know, really make more stick. And uh, it, so it, it comes down to it's not always what you're saying. It's how you say it. And so I think, yeah, if, if anyone that can relay such technical information to yes. such a wide audience, that's it, it's that's something to tip their, your hat to, you know, because it's it's not always easily done. Oh, yeah. So that's fantastic. Good stuff, man. Good job, Zach. Thank you. Thank you, Clint. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll uh, I'll jump into some market stuff here, and it, it's been interesting, and I, I've got to learn some new things uh, about the year. So, as we all know, uh, Black Friday was was just yes. upon us, and from a retail standpoint, you know that's the largest shopping day of the year, um, and honestly, it, it's no different for retail when it comes to animals, when it comes to reptiles, or even breeders if you approach it the right way. So. There's kind of a few things I wanted to uh, to discuss, and then I'm going to get into some kind of nitty gritty numbers uh, for a bit. So, when I have conversations pretty frequently with individuals when it comes to quote unquote sales, mm-hmm. or lowering the price, when to lower it, uh, there's been a lot of anger and, and gripings, <laughs> really from the ball python community more so than than colubrids when it about crashing the market and, and things of that nature. And, um, you know, I've always said that you don't hear as much from the colubrid side because, you know, when we're adjusting prices, it's normally like 25 bucks. Mm-hmm. It's not, you know, thousands in a swipe and angering everybody else who's got hundreds of that same animal that uh, now have to lower theirs thousands in a swipe. So, um, so here's kind of, and this is going to be an opinion piece, but Obviously, it's an, an opinion that comes with a lot of experience behind it, okay? Not not just in reptiles, but in business and the retail side and in really just product. And I'm putting that in air quotes right now because, you know, I hate to refer to animals as product, but in, in the terms of what we're speaking about right now, um, it, it's kind of the, the perception. So when it comes to a sale... You know, what I mean is like a special, okay? So not mm-hmm. like a transaction, but a special. Personally, I run specials every single week on something. Yep. Um, because it garners attention, right? And I have product sales and I have like a daily deal for a specific animal or a specific type of animal where if you want it that day, here's the price. And, and you know, I make it, make it nice. So... Do I think that everyone should just go in and undercut, you know, pricing when things slow down? Absolutely not. Don't jump to to that kind of move. Get a feel for your market. If you're the most expensive on something, yeah, you're going to be sitting on it for a long, long time. You know that 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 happens. Um, but you should, probably shouldn't be the the cheapest either. I mean, mm-hmm. my opinion is I know the work I put into an animal. This is the value that I feel it should sit at, um, and I, but I'm, I'm never the most expensive ever. But that's that's the first bit of, I guess, advice I want to give out there is in a market that like, like what we're experiencing right now, doing a sale, you know, frequently having something on sale is a good thing. That's a good thing. Um, now, when it comes to things like Black Friday, because I would see some posts from people that I'm friends with on Facebook and, you know, Full on respect for them, no issues. Um, excuse me. I would see where they would post. You know, they're absolutely not going to lower prices on Black Friday, and and I understand where they're coming from because I think that they're viewing it more as a detriment to the market as a whole. But that is not the case whenever you're looking at an event. Mm-hmm. And an event is different than just the lowering of all the pricing on what you have on things or just running a sale. Because things like Black Friday, that's to me not a sale. That is an event. And people want to be a part of an event. Yeah. Um, and if you're going to participate in an event, you have to make it an event. It's got to be something big. Um as it stands right now, we had two events with Metazotics last year, and that was our anniversary sale, um, and that was Black Friday. And hands down, 
those events were the, the largest volume days we've – I mean, nothing was even close to those two. <laughs> not, not even close. Um, so – that's, again, a piece of advice is when, it, when there's something like an event that is whether you're putting on the event or you're participating in an event, do it. You know, yeah. if you're wanting to, to have financial success, don't let those moments pass you by. Morph Market had their first um, Morph Madness sale, which was like an event before Black Friday. They wanted to get that in before, you know, competing mm-hmm. with all the retail um, stores. And it was a success. And the reason it was – now, were things moving at you know a substantially less you know, dollar value than normal? Yeah. But how many more eyes were on it yeah. and were wanting to make that purchase at that point because they were participating in an event? Um, so, so just think about that. Keep that in mind. Um, I will say you know, we talk a lot about – this the market and the slowing of the market this year and in fact i've now seen some numbers that suggest it's not necessarily a slowing of the market um and, and i'll go into that in just a second but our black friday success um it ran friday saturday sunday monday you know for us but in just the first two days just the weekend friday and saturday um, Metazotics alone, over a hundred animals left the shop over a hundred animals. And that was both in store and online. Um, there was literally a line halfway down the block to get into the store when we opened. And I mean, for a, a little you know pet shop, here, I mean, how incredible <laughs> is that, cool. right? Oh, it was exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, now there was a lot of marketing that went into that and I don't mean a lot of dollars spent, but you know, steadily posting on social media in ways that people engaged with, enjoyed, laughed, had a good time. Um, so it was, it was nice to see the work that the team here put into making it an event, yes. made it exactly what we hoped that it would be. Um, you know, we set our goal on what we hope to achieve, and it was a lofty one, and it was surpassed and surpassed early. Um, so that was great. And, and just to, I guess, also put it in perspective, not just in reptiles, but in retail as a whole, our shop didn't open until noon on Friday. That's our typical time to open. And I didn't do it any earlier because what's the point in me battling yeah. with Best Buy and Walmart mm-hmm. and all – right? There, there's no reason for that. But that also means that all those big you know, blockbuster Black Friday de- deals, people already went and spent their money on in our area. Yeah. Yet that still occurred even when we opened at noon. That's cool. Right? It was super exciting, super, super. So if you're listening and you're one of the um, customers that purchased online because those my phone was just buzzing all day with online orders coming through, thank you so much. You, you really, I mean, you, you humbled us. I mean, it was, it was incredible. Um, so when we talk about this slowing market, I've got some numbers that uh, came from, from Morph Market, and it was – Month by month, the total number of animals that were sold are marked as sold via the site. Now, you know, there's going to be some variants here, obviously. Uh, there's going to be animals that weren't marked sold, and, you know, they could have been sold elsewhere. They just had been listed on Mork Market at, you know, that point. And here's something that I find interesting. So through November, there have been – a total of, let's see, last year through November, 78,232 animals marked sold that had been listed on Morph Market. Through November this year, 80,593. <laughs> that is remarkably consistent. Yeah, so, so an, it, well, an increase of 2,361, and I know they're going to have even more this final month. They'll beat out the, the same thing. So a 3% increase in animals sold. So I think what we are seeing based off that number, and I don't have these numbers, however, through conversations with Darian, uh, the owner of Morph Market, I know that there's a significant amount of significant more, more significant, larger, okay, <laughs> a, uh, a larger amount of the of animals listed this year than last year. 
So I don't think the market has tanked. The market has actually remained flat because we're only seeing a 3% growth. So I'm going to call that flat, you know, in, in here. But there's such a significant increase in Animal. available animals. That's the issue. You know, that's the quote unquote slowing of the market that many are feeling primarily in the ball python market. And that's, it makes complete sense because there was such a spike in 2020. Yep. Now they're producing in 2023. Yeah. And here we are, it, it, you know, exactly. You know, so it does make a lot of sense. I'll also say, you know, these numbers are just representation are a representation of what's happening on morph market. Now what I'm seeing in um, shows, shows seem to have picked up, meaning I've moved a lot more animals in a show this year than what I have averaged in shows in the past. Um, and I think that where that's coming from is with less disposable income in the pocket, people don't want to pay shipping. Yeah, <laughs> they, hate, no, they, don't. they hate it. They hate paying shipping. I'll, well, not only do they hate paying – I'll speak to this as a consumer – not only do we hate paying shipping, but the shipping's gone up. Yes, it has. It, it absolutely like shipped has. something to Florida back in the day was from here in Wheeling, West Virginia, was forty dollars. Mm -hmm. like it didn't matter. <laughs> now it's like seventy. Yeah, and I was that's with, say sixty-eight. Um, yep. <laughs> yep, and and that's uh, with um, with the shipping company that I use. So yeah. with that discount, and I have the maximum discount you can get. Yeah. So no, I I know when I'm buying animals, I don't know why. But that shipping piece is, yes, I agree with that statement. Yeah, it's 100%. Oh, and I think that that's what's making the difference on why I'm seeing the uptick in show sales compared to online mm -hmm. sales is that right there. Um, and I mean, for us, it's I, I personally, we take a little bit of a hit on the, the shipping. We do a flat rate $45 on whatever and wherever it's going. Um, and I think that that's one thing that has helped our online you know, transactions is because it's, it's going to be one of the lower, you know, shipping costs. And, um, but, you know, again, I, I just think that whenever you really step back, That's look at numbers and look at things as a whole, you can understand why certain markets are struggling. Certain markets are doing just as well as they always have, um, even through, you know, a, a, again, quote unquote, downturning economy. So um, very interesting stuff, in my opinion. Yes. Um, I think it's, it continues to, as long as you, you do the things that make sense at times like this, and you do participate in, in doing the numbers, the way they need to be done, you know, um, and yeah. adjusting yours the way you should, when you should, um, you can still continue to be successful and, um, no I, good I stuff. It's been proven out there. So thank you for um, that analysis, Clint. Hey, no problem. <laughs> I, hope, I, I, uh, I Go ahead. I, I, I like it when I, I don't like I've never liked when people like scream from the mountaintops doom. Mm -hmm. I like it when, you know, somebody can r raise the alarm, but let's like learn what the hell is driving what we're seeing. Correct. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Um, so because it's like if that's correct. Then it's basically the same amount of buying. It's just the market might be a little bit flooded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that it? <clears throat> yeah, that, that's kind yeah. of what I'm seeing. And it's – I think that that rings true too whenever I look at certain species that – you know, when, when you take ball pythons out of the equation and we're talking colubrids, there's certain species that moved a lot slower this year. Things like um, T-negative albino Nelson's milk snakes. And I think that's, that's very specific. <laughs> that's, I produced a lot of them and it, they've been slower, you know, but I think it's because there there's a lot of them out there. And I, you know, understand that. So that's one that, yeah, you'll see specials pop up from me, you know, because I think that that's the right thing to do, um, you know, in, in that situation. But then there's other things like green bush rat snakes, where I think there's yep. three of us in the country that really produce these with any regularity. And, oh, yeah, I sell out of those, no problem mm -hmm. at, you know, whatever price point we want to put on them. Um, so I think it goes to that where it's just it's supply and demand. It's not a lack of interest or a lack of funds, it's supply and demand is what we're experiencing right now. So very cool. So 
Do you, do you want to talk about that product? Yes, I do. I was going to say, since we're talking market, and this is going to tie back into um, when we were discussing the UVB and hog nose. Mm-hmm. So normally we don't really get into product on the show. No. But there's something that's now coming to the U.S. It's already been released over in the U.K. that – I was so stoked about. I sent it uh, <laughs> over to Zach, and I'm like, "We, we got to talk about this because this is a game changer." And excuse me, <clears throat> sinuses are starting to kick in a little bit. Yeah, guys. yeah, you gonna Apologize. pass out? Sorry. No, 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 I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> okay, good. Just want to make sure I can breathe as yeah. I continue to uh, talk. Every time you snort, I'm expecting you to go <laughs> bam. No, no. When, whenever you see me pull my yeah uh, um, headphones off. It's not because you're loud. It's just uh, oh. let's release a little bit of pressure. Okay, that's, you gotcha. know, make sure I cool I down thought I was bit. blowing your eardrums out. Nope, nope, so. nope. That's what it okay, is. Cool. It's just pulling pressure off my head. <laughs> so, okay. Guys, check this out. This isn't me trying to sell you anything. This is not, you know, something that's like endorsed by Kluber and Kluberoid Radio. But I... I haven't been as excited about a product, I don't think, ever as I am about this because of what it can do to the hobby as a whole. If you get the opportunity, hop on YouTube and look up Luminize. It's made by Arcadia, and it's spelled L-U-M-E-N-I-Z-E, Luminize. So here's what this can do. What these are is it comes in both a UVB fixture of all sizes and all UVB um, bulbs that they carry. So 6%, 12%, 14%. <clears throat> it also comes in LED, which is a light that's going to stimulate plant growth significantly. Okay. What these do, first off, it's controlled by your phone. It's controlled by a smart app. Mm -hmm. You will have the ability with this product to create both dusk and dawn for your animals. Now, before I move on to the other things, let's think about that for a second. Right now, what we do to everything that we put (laughs) UVB on, it goes from total darkness to midday light immediately. Mm -hmm. Boom. And then it goes from midday light to darkness. Boom. How do you feel <laughs> when you're asleep and someone flips your lights on, right? It's it's not natural. Now, have we been operating like that for ages and ages? Of course. Yeah. But what I like about this, and, and you'll understand even more as we continue, think about all the species that we struggle with to reproduce in captivity, while this isn't going to solve the problem for all of them, there is going to be a percentage of them that we see an increase in our ability to reproduce them in captivity because we are able to take yet another step in giving them the most natural lighting cycle they could have. And that is exciting. Now, here's the thing. You are able to completely alter how you want that light cycle to go. So when I say a dawn, I don't mean, oh, it starts off at 6 a.m. and at 6.30, it's at its peak. No, 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 no. Mm -mm. You can operate this with like a four-hour ramp up, you know, four-hour dawn period, a four-hour peak, which that's what it's really going to be like in, you know, most seasons and most climates, and then like a four-hour decline, you know, going down to dusk. And that I think is something that's so truly incredible. And another piece is when you operate a bulb like that, it if you operate it in, in those terms with those types of, you know, four hour ramp up, four hour peak, four hour decline, you'll end up spending 30% less on energy yep. to operate that fixture and bulb. So you save money over the course of the life of this fixture because of how it operates the bulb. You're giving your animal such a a difference in what we have been providing 
I, I just think it's incredible. I, I think it's so <laughs> neat. And then when you combine, like, you know how I've kind of really been a nerd when it comes to bioactives over this mm-hmm. past year. I've really, really gotten into them. You throw the LED on there for the for the um, plants as well. And, I, I mean, you're just – you're creating this – as naturalistic of a environment for your animals, you possibly can. I mean, it's yep. insane. So I'm telling you guys, watch the videos. It's, it's incredible what this product can do. You can create, uh, forgive me. I, I'm still nerding out on it. <laughs> it's still going. You know, we, we talked about what it can do for a day. You can create seasons because of mm-hmm. this. You can create these day and night cycles and these dawns and these dusks that change with a season. So that's why I say when we talk about really being able to ramp up captive production of certain species, that's why. I mean, when you combine yep. that with, you know, humidity levels and, and everything else, I mean, just wow. I mean, I think there's certain python species that this is really going to be a game changer for, uh, lizard species, but even, I mean, some more advanced colubrids that uh, I think can really make a difference for us. So, Check it out. It's I think the product is supposed to hit the second week. So I think we're about a week away before the boat lands here in the US. <laughs> um, and then it'll be, you know, distributed to those who are going to get it. Um, yes, Metazotics is going to carry it. That's not a, a shameless plug. Um, it's just obviously one of the reasons I know so much about it is I've I've been talking to the distributor for months about when this was going to hit. And now that it's it's really getting here, it, it's Got me stoked, man. No. I, the, the the reef aquarium community has had this kind of technology for quite some time. And I've seen some uh, – there's been a couple instances where, especially on Advancing Herpetological Husbandry, that Facebook group, where you'll see people take those light banks from a reef aquarium and then kind of incorporate them into a vivarium. But to actually have, like, let's be real, the leader in light – yeah be the the company that's bringing that that's that's pretty awesome i I know that we will definitely be getting some of those Uh, and i just thought i mean with what you're doing with the hog nose i thought oh yeah an incredible way to study it'd be neat to actually study them um with the old way where you just flip the uvb light on flip Mm -hmm. it off and then have this whole ramping piece because i will say that uh one of the super interesting things about being out in the field with them there was definitely a uvb range where they were active uh mm-hmm. and that was pretty cool yeah i, I so, think yeah that'd be i'm very interested to see what results <laughs> you know you come up with yeah. uh when no, testing no, no. that out so but that yeah to have a herb centric version of that tech is pretty awesome yeah that you control with your phone your phone yeah <laughs> you can do so many damn things with this phone <laughs> like, yeah no i have the smart plugs on everything at home now i've got mm-hmm. i i purchased uh i had my you know I'm, I'm 44 but i claim that i have senior moments i had this moment last week where i was like oh crap i gotta buy govies so i bought govies and then i think it was on saturday i was like crap i gotta buy govies <laughs> and i bought govies in the morning <laughs> and i went down and checked the mail and there they were in the mailbox i was like okay is Amazon like doing this within the hour now? And I was like, <laughs> oh, but it doesn't matter. You can't have enough govies as yeah, far as I'm yeah. concerned. But so yeah, no, I would. Plenty. Yeah, I run the lights and, and and keep track of all my temps off my damn phone. Anyway, okay. Right. Well, shall we move on to uh, this the species highlight? Yeah, absolutely, let's day? do it. Okay, so i I kept a pair of Carinata. I, I raised them to be uh, they weren't adults they were sub adults and then i i moved them on because they were part of that casualty from my somewhat infamous ditching of the asian rat snakes mm-hmm. um and i can honestly say given that i like large feisty sometimes smelly colubrids they are one of the few that i do kick myself for not seeing it through to the end mm-hmm. um there weren't many from that time but care not are definitely there uh, but, uh, Clint here, he, he, I mean, you are the perfect guest, I think for King rats, because <laughs> how long have you been keeping King rats? Oh gosh. I think I got my first pair, maybe 2012, something yeah. like that. So, so we're going on, you know, a decade plus. Yeah. 
of, of keeping Carinata. Uh, so we're just going to do this the way we normally do. Um, so uh, first and foremost, just to get a little bit of science out of the way, uh, we are talking about the king rat snake, uh, Alethe Carinata. Um, currently, there are two subspecies recognized. Um, there's Carinata, Carinata. There was a there was a, a mainland Asiatic subspecies that was synonymized back into Carinata. Uh, but uh, we have that species, and then we have um, a species of king rat or subspecies that's endemic to Japan, um, which it's funny. I tried saying that subspecies name like three freaking times. I cannot say it, so we're just going to call them the Yunans. Yeah. Uh, they, they are definitely rarer than mm-hmm. straight Carinata, um, and I have always liked them, and they just have a really – interesting look um not many of them here in the states but you can definitely find them if you're dedicated to the cause you will pay a pretty penny for them uh and i know that they are present in european herpetoculture as well so uh you know that's the deal but but this is a snake that is large um it's kind in many ways it's the anti-rat snakes rat snakes don't typically have keeled scales Mm -hmm. carinata is heavily keeled Mm -hmm. uh and that was one of the things that i like because i've always liked snakes that have uh, keeled scales and um, somewhat notorious for their defensive behaviors, which I'll let Clint speak to. But one of the alternative names for this snake, which I've I've loved mm-hmm. uh, since I was a little kid reading about it, is the stinking goddess because they have a tendency to musk first, bite later. Uh, and their musk is probably one of the more unique musks uh, that you can experience from a colubrid. So, uh, you know, that's that. And... They get big. Um, this is a snake that can get in excess of seven feet mm-hmm. without really trying. Um, that's probably a normal size. No, nah, that's probably a smaller, older adult would be holding right. in at seven feet. So with that kind of general uh, intro out of the way, they're, I feel like they're a little bit more common than they used to be, but they're still not overly abundant. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, absolutely. There's so, a lot of them that are coming over that are farmed. Yeah. So when you see a, I'm going to use the word cheap, but less. When you see a Carinata on a, on a table at a show and it's a hundred dollars less than all the other Carinata that you've seen, there's a reason, um, and it's more than likely a, a farmed animal. Um, so I'd, I'd just be a little cautious. Yeah. Know, on, on those. Well, I actually want to talk about that for a second. Um, so in Asia, uh, snakes are actually – colubrids are farmed for food. Uh, like we grow chickens for chicken fingers. Snake meat is part of the diet in, in a lot of Asiatic street cu- cuisine in particular. And um, these things are farmed. So I, I knew I wanted to kind of talk about that. Word of warning for those farmed carinata that are cheap on the, t- on the table – because I am reading the title of a scientific manuscript that I was able to find. Um, Isolation and identification of four pathogenic bacterial strains from edible snake farms with pneumonia in China. So the way that the animals are kept, I don't know if this is the way they're kept on every farm, but uh, this is a manuscript that you can find. It's open access. I'm literally reading it. I found it 20 minutes before we started recording. But uh, this is something that has always fascinated me. Here in the States and, and, you know, parts of Europe and wherever we're doing private herpetoculture, we're, we're going to great lengths. Yeah. Keep our – we don't cohab our snakes usually. Some people do. I'm not really anti that for the record for, for a lot of species. Uh, hygiene, we're all about hygiene. Um, feed them the best food we can possibly feed. And I'm just going to read to you the conditions of the snake farm <laughs> – where these snakes were being farmed. This is straight from the manuscript. So um, it says here, this is just case history. Uh, the case was received from an edible snake farm in, forgive me, I do not speak Chinese, uh, Zishui County, Huang City, Hubei Province, China, in October 2019. This farm this farm has raised more than 2,000 one-year-old Alefe Carinata and nearly 1,000 uh, Pataeus mucosa I love this seedlings. So apparently baby snake is called a seedling All um, right. Noted. since the beginning of summer in 2019. So that's 2000 Carinata in one season were produced. 
Um, some snakes have shown clinical signs of lethargy, anorexia, and poor growth rates, morbidity, and mortality increased over time. In October 2019, the morbidity of Alephe carinata reached 30%. And among mm. those, that 30%, mortality was 80%. Snakes, here's your, here are the conditions they're raised in. Snakes were raised in separate rooms according to different species and ages. Each room was four by five by three meters in size. So that's 12 by 20, sorry, sorry, 16 by 20 by 12 feet in size. And the floor was paved with sand and stones. Uh, the floor was heated. The room temperature was controlled to 27 to 29 degrees C. And no humidification equipment was set up. There was no disinfection area in the entrance and no disinfection procedures were taken, which led to potential infectious disease transmission. Here's what they were fed. Healthy snakes were fed with chicken, while snakes, while six snakes were force fed with chicken mince, which I believe is I take a chicken, I chop it up, turn it into a slurry and shove it down their throat. The gavage tube was cross used for anorexic snakes and no sterilization procedures were taken between each feeding, which potentially sped up infections. So wow. we are certainly not promoting keeping the snakes that way. But the, the point of the matter is that this is a snake that species that is it's weird because in, in certain scenarios, when we're keeping them you know, to the best of our absolute ability, doting on them, for lack of a better word. Uh, you know, people have failure to thrive. Meanwhile, 2,000 of these things were produced on one farm in 2019, and those were the conditions that they were being kept in. So we are not promoting that. I don't want somebody to misinterpret. I just thought our listeners would find that somewhat interesting. <laughs> Absolutely. Wow. Wow. And I'm sitting here thinking <laughs> that when you describe those rooms, them just leaving all of them in there together – you know, yes. loose basically. And, and I'm thinking how many of them cannibalized one another because it's oh, yeah. something this species does. I've mm -hmm. had it happen. <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah. man. So. Yeah. The strong survive under those conditions. Yeah. So, uh, so with that being said, let's just cover our bases like we normally do. Um, so general husbandry, if you have like a neonate versus an adult versus a sub adult, like what's the procedure for for keeping these guys? So I had, I've kept them on a variety of substrates, and I've kind of I think I've settled now because I went through this when I first got them. Let's start at the beginning. When I first got them, I, I started with a pair of T negative albinos um, as babies. I got them from from Rob Zirkel, mm -hmm. and um, they were. Fantastic. Um, I kept them on um, peat moss, so mm -hmm. dirt, soil, yeah. basically. And I did that for the first several years. I mean, so I, I think for the first four years. Um, and I moved them to larger rack systems as they, they got bigger. When I first got them as, as hatchlings, started in a six quart that, that didn't last long with, with this species. Yeah. Um, and, you know, moved them on up. And they actually did pretty well because they are a fairly secretive species. They're 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 high strung. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So the less of you they see, they, they tend to like that. Um, and that seemed to do very very well. And um, I then I kind of redid my room, moved everything to these really large like boa racks. Mm -hmm. And so I moved them there and I put them on Cyprus and I don't like it. I don't like no, them on okay. Cyprus, uh, not with them. Um, and it was because, you know, you, we get into this mode where Asian species, humidity, you, you know, you, you think yeah. of all these, these things that are just supposed to go with that because we're lumping, when we say an Asian rat snake, we tend to lump too much into that mm -hmm. bucket. And I ended up having a male get like a um, kind of a scale rot going on with that. And, you know, it was a battle. I, I mean, we're talking a big snake um, because these get uh, – mine were eight feet. The, these uh, – the, the big albinos, eight feet and as big around as my forearm and I'm not a small man. So you are not. They, 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 they're, <laughs> these were big, strong snakes. And um, so – I now I've moved. I, I started trying aspen, and I tend to like that the best as far as ease of cleanup plus what they seem to do well on. Mm -hmm. um, more so, the, as long as you're providing them a humid hide, 
Um, and I was, I tried the human hide with Cypress with them and I still don't like it. You know? Uh, <laughs> so what we do now is I use, uh, the cocoa fiber mm-hmm. and we use that in their hide boxes. And that seems to be going pretty well. Uh, the only thing with Aspen that I've noticed is sometimes it, it, they're a big snake with a big nostril, right? Yeah. And so whenever they're going to shed, there's times where, you know, I've walked in and I've seen where they've kind of got a mouth gape and I'm like, oh, what are we dealing with? And what I've found that it is, is they've got Aspen dust in their nostrils and that it only seems to happen when they're shedding. Once that shed happens, that dust comes, you know, out, frees the nostrils and they're completely back to normal with no issues. Um, So just kind of something, and I, I don't really see that too often with anything else unless it's a species that has a nostril big enough to get clogged by the dust yeah. of Aspen. So uh, just to kind of a word to wise, but I would say if you're wanting to set these guys up in something more naturalistic, um, I think peat moss is a good, because they're going to pack it down. It's going to, yeah. it's not going to be loose with this big snake crawling on it. It's, it's going to be packed. And uh, they seem to have done very, very well on that. They bred consistently. It wasn't until I moved them to Cyprus that I missed two years of production oh. with them. They, and I don't know if there's other things I did wrong at that that point, but um, they did great on the the peat moss. And then when we moved them to Cyprus, um, I'm sorry, not Cyprus, to back to Aspen, we had a, another great season, you know, with several clutches hitting. So um, those are kind of the substrates I'd recommend, just depending on how you want your cage to look. I guess you know, so to sure. speak. they seem to do well on both. Well, um, what temperatures do you keep them at? Room. Room. Yeah, so about 74. I There's times of the year when I'm first kicking them in gear, I may give them you know, a supplemental heat of like 76 to 80. But my, these are in – now all of them are in four-foot cages. So yeah. if I give them a one-by-one one warm spot, they've got plenty of room to get away from it and not feel anything. Um, so I may give them a little bit just to see if they you know, need it for digestion in the beginning. But once the room – has warmed up and is staying at a solid 74 to 76, depending on the time of year. Um, I don't put any heat on them whatsoever and they tend to do great. Just fine. Just like that. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Just like that. Um, they're a, they can be a curious species. It, it's mm-hmm. funny, man. I'll tell you what, they have a variety of personality. They, they really <laughs> do. So, if someone asked me what a Carinata is like, as a whole, the species is going to probably be fairly aggressive and anxious. You know, that's if I was going to describe the species, that's them. However, the first two that I had, that pair of albinos, the T negatives, never once did they even act like they were going to strike at me. <laughs> ever. Ever. And so I've got, I think, I don't know, somewhere around 15, 16, you know, uh, um, anywhere between two to you know, 10 years uh, back there. So a lot of big ones. And there's about a third of them that don't even act like they, you know, want to do anything aggressive. <laughs> they just want to get away from me. That's, you know, all of them will do that. They all want to get away from you. Don't think this is a snake you're going to sit back and just cuddle. It's, it's going to move <laughs> the entire time you're holding, uh-huh. you know, um, there's about a third of them that will, they, they want to get away, but they'll nip at me if I'm messing with them, you know? And then there's like <laughs> this third that when you're moving around, they're coming up to the glass, looking at you, just saying, are we going to do this today? <laughs> you know, it's, they want. That would be the third I would me. want. <laughs> yeah, it's, they, man, it's funny because it's, there's some that, no, it's not backing down. Go ahead, put your hand, go ahead. I pooped right there. Reach in here, grab it. Reach in here, great. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. where I've got to distract them and get them to come to a different side of the cage so I can spot mm-hmm. clean, you know, that one. Um, but it, it's, you really do have a variety, you know, of them. I, there's some, I, you know, I open the cage and they bolt to hide and get away. And then there's those ones mm-hmm. that are wanting to shoot out of the cage after you. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting group. To well, well since we're, we're on this topic, let's talk about that third, uh, because they, they, they do have a reputation when they mm-hmm. are, I don't want to say bad. Cause I don't think that's the right word. Mm-hmm. Um, when, when they're on, like, you know, they're, they're upset. They're being defensive. What does that look like? 
is there hissing? Is there pooping? Is there biting? So, is okay. it a full blown bite or is it a mock bite? Like we just, as, oh, they'll chomp you. They'll, they'll yeah, chomp you. It, it, yeah. It's, I've only been actually. I'm sitting here thinking. I don't know if I have taken a shot from a Carinata, but I everybody who works for me has. <laughs> 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 there you um, go. I, there's a, a young man by the name of Bailey. He's a he's a boa mm. guy, and he used to uh, take care of cages for me whenever I would travel for my previous job. And that poor kid got bit by Carinata <laughs> like once a week, and they were the big <laughs> ones that got him. <laughs> and I don't know if it's you know I think there's a difference in the experience level of just being able to read a snake and yep. know how to maneuver them without taking a shot. Um, so that's whenever I say I rarely get bit by anything, it's, it's that, it's that reason. Um, and you know, given the guys that are dealing with them, whether it's Bailey, whether it's Steve or Drew, who's in the nursery, they're bold, you know, they're just going to grab them. They, they don't fear them, which, you know, that's what I need when dealing with snakes like that. Um, and so, you know, when you do that with big aggressive snakes, you're probably mm-hmm. going to get a shot here and there. Um, but yes, when they bite, you're going to know it. You know, because they're a good sized snake with a good sized mouth. Um, you're going to bleed. There, there's no doubt there. But with like what you're, you know, referring to that nickname they've got, Stinking Goddess. Um, mm-hmm. I'll be honest with you. I've only smelled true hardcore Carinata musk once. And that's with me making a lot of them mad. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it's just because that came more from wild caught specimens. Yeah. You know, that that's a I could see that. very um that's a defense that they do there. But in captivity, I just haven't had a lot of it. I get musk more by black rat snakes than I do yep. Carinata, to be honest with you. Um it's potent, you know, that <laughs> one time that it happened, it it stinks and it's you know one that stays with you. But uh, I don't think that that's something they really go to as much in captivity. Uh they're more apt to, you know, fight or flight is what gotcha. they're really trying to do. Um and and I'll tell you, when we're talking about like handling these big guys, they hook worth shit. <laughs> it's no, I, I mean, it sounds like want, a false water cobra. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of false water cobra yeah. analogs here, for the record. <laughs> you know, I kind of look at it as if you really want to like practice some of your hooking technique with some like tougher venomous species. This is a, a species to do that with because mm-hmm. they, they come back up the hook yes. very quickly, very frequently um, with a lot of body, you know, behind it mm-hmm. to, to be able to do it. Um, so they're, they're not easy to move from one cage to another without, you know, really you have to take that chance of taking a hit, you know, to, to really be able to do it and to support such a big snake, you know, with, it's going to take two hands. It's going to take a hook and a hand. Um, so yeah, they don't hook well. They their head shape already makes them look angry yes. all the time. Anyway, they have an RBF big time. <laughs> all the customers who come through the shop uh-huh. when I have them out here, they you know they say the same thing. Um, and they the that subspecies, the Unin, they look like a um, king cobra to yes. me. The, mm-hmm. Their coloration and the little they just have a little bit different head structure. In, there was in my an idea eye. that they might have been mimicking them i can see it for a little while Mm -hmm. and well and they they're you know going to eat other snakes as well yeah um i've had that happen unfortunately um but it's yeah just know that you know going into them they're they're very very cool species very 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 cool um just that it's going to take some you know dedication (laughs) so so when they get angry is this i can't remember if this is one that does this or not do they hiss they do they do an open mouth display i can't they no. will huff a little bit. Uh, okay. I'll have you know an occasional huff out of them, and they will hiss during a strike. Yes, you know, so I remember like, them like a. Whoosh, whoosh. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. So they're not like a you know where a bull or a gopher that's going to kind yeah. of have that rattle hiss at you, but when they strike, it's going to scare you because they're fast, they're big, and it's going to be audible. You know, whenever yeah. it comes. So, so nice. yeah, they do do it that way. Um, so then you, you've mentioned that. They won't hesitate to eat each other. Um, mm-hmm. Let's talk a little bit about feeding uh, our our charges here. So, when they come out of the egg, they're a pretty big baby. If I, mm-hmm. you know, mine were fresh out of the egg. I got mine from uh, a false water cobra guy, actually, who just had a handful of other large colubrids. Anybody listening that knows Kyle Wilson, you know, you'll you'll know that. But um, 
he, yeah, my pair, I, re- I remember getting them and they were like three or four weeks old, had eaten a couple times and they were every bit as big as a baby false water cobra. So that was mm-hmm. one of the things oh, yeah. that I found yeah. you know, impressive. And they just would, they would not take anything off of tongs, but they ate every freaking time I drop fed them, they ate religiously. Is that like my experience or is that just the typical King Absolutely. Rat experience? Yeah, that's my experience as well. Like I said, this is a high high anxiety type uh, you mm-hmm. know, species and the babies big time. Um, as babies, they don't want you to watch them eat. They don't want you to be in the mm-hmm. room. It's I mean, if you try to tease feed them, they're just going to want to run. Um, they may strike, but they're, they don't want to hold on to it. Uh, so, yes, the best thing to do is just – Drop feed and whether it's frozen or live, because some you know want the frozen, some don't want the frozen. Uh, but yeah, drop feeding is exactly what we need to do, you know, on our in here with all of the young Carinata. Now, as they get a little size on them, that changes. I, I think it, it's they become a lot like the false water cobras in the sense of they are chow hounds. I mean, they yeah. they will eat. Now, I still have a handful that don't really want you around and. Those are the, that third that runs, you know, when you open the cage. Mm-hmm. But there's any of the others. I mean, if they see that that's what you got, they're going to hit it like a Brooks, you know, will hit it. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So they, they do become much more aggressive feeders and they become the garbage disposal. You know, yes. you have those species that are like that. Yep. But I say it because I want to warn people. You don't want to do too much of that with them if you plan on breeding them. Because – that was the other thing that I felt was inhibiting some of our production uh, out of that species for you know about two years because those big T negatives, I think I got too big. Gotcha. I, I was feeding them. I mean, they could take a large rat easily <laughs> and I would feed them a large rat like once a week because they'd fully digest it. You know, it's not like a boa where you would feed, you know, a big meal and you're looking at, you know, seven to 10 days before it passes, you feed a Carinata a big meal and it's crapped it out in four days, you know? Yeah. And I think that, and they don't look fat, even whenever you've put, you know, a good amount of weight on them, they, they look like a muscle. They, they really yep. do. Um, so I think that I probably got them a little too heavy compared to their natural state. And I think that that really slowed down, um, them wanting to to lock up and wanting to go through the cycle. I found that smaller Carinata tend to breed a lot easier, a lot faster. Those in that kind of five foot range, I mean, those males get the job done. Um, But even the bigger males, like, um, you know, there's some that have got one back there at seven foot. And I mean, I think he bred three females, four females uh, this year without a problem. But that's one that I didn't overfeed. I made sure- If he's getting a once a week feeding, it's not the biggest meal he can take. It's, you know, he he's in by no means is it just a maintenance feeding. I don't mean that either, um, but I just made sure we didn't use them as the garbage disposals, and um, we we had a lot better success that way. So so as far as food, is it a once a week? Once they like, do you do twice a week when they're babies? Once a week, or is it just once a week the whole? Yeah, Time. I'm pretty much a once a week, you know. Now, if I wanted to go every five days on babies, I think that that's pretty safe with most babies of yeah. just about any species because they're just growth, growth, growth. It doesn't go into fat, fat, fat. So it, it adds length, mm-hmm. not girth, you know. But for the adults, we still keep them on a weekly feeding. We just kind of ensure that we're not packing them too heavy. Gotcha. Um, we try to rotate. Oh. He has frozen. <sighs> okay, we are at 129. Oh, and he's out. And I'm all by myself. Okay, well, if Eric doesn't edit this, hello, everyone. I'm by myself. Let's bring him back in. (laughs) 
Just waiting. Waiting, waiting, waiting. One twenty nine. All right. Sorry, guys. <laughs> That's okay. All right. Uh, you were talking about the feeding rate. Feeding rate. Okay. So as adults, yeah, we feed. Uh, we stay on a once-a-week feeding. Uh, we do try to rotate prey items if possible. We'll do rats. We'll do chicks. Um, even large retired breeder mice to, to mix it in there, just depending on the size of, uh, of the adult that we're feeding. Um, they'll eat. Just about anything. So any kind of poultry, you can put pieces of chicken in there. They'll eat it. Um, they'll take. I, I believe they'll take frog legs. I mean, they'll eat just about anything that you know. They're a very opportunistic feeder. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I typically once a week is is fine. If we do feed a big meal, I'll kind of skip a week at least on the males. Gotcha. But usually once a week is fine. So let's talk about them eating other snakes. <laughs> Is this a mating issue or so I, it, it's not as bad as some species in my experience. What I have found, I've never had a male attempt to eat a female. Never had that. Mm. Um, even if the males bear, I have not had a female attempt to eat a male. That's the same size as her or bigger. I have had a female attempt on a smaller male. And it's I've, it's not happened immediately, and that's the part that sucks and is scary <laughs> because <delayed>. yes. So <laughs> this species doesn't really want to lock up in front of you either. Mm -hmm. Now I've come in and found them locked up, but it's you know it's not always something that's going to like if you turn the lights off and you know you're kind of flashlighting them, you might be able to catch it, but. They're normally – they're not you know, like corns that as soon as you put them in, boom, you got a tail lock and it's happening. So you have to leave them together a little bit <laughs> <laughs> and generally a few days. So you're kind of going to have to roll the dice. So I guess the advice I'd give you is don't put a smaller male with a female because I had it, had it once with a female that tried to eat this smaller male. We caught it in time luckily and they had been together like three days. And Oh, my goodness. We caught it right when it was happening, separated. It's a hypo male. And for those who, you know, are, pay attention to Carinata, that is one of the color mutations that is in the States, but it's probably the hardest one in the States to find. <laughs> so, because there's a lot so of this was stroke yeah. inducing. <laughs> yes. So, because there's species that we don't even, or I'm sorry, mutations we don't even have over here yet. So, you know, but of the mutations that are here, this is the hardest one for me to get my hands on. And then it was maybe two months later, female, same thing. And although this time I was too late. He was oh. already, you know, halfway down. And um, so we lost our hypo, visual hypo male. Uh, and it's actually a lot of our Carinatas are projects that I have with Matt, Matt Most, yeah. our, our good buddy. And so, yeah, I got to call Matt and go, hey, bud, <laughs> <laughs> you know that hypo yeah. that almost got eight? Yeah, he he got eight. <laughs> yeah, he, he done. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, that's th so again. It's not something that's incredibly prevalent in, in you know the experience I've had with them. But I've never really offered them other snakes, you know, either to see if you know yeah. they are more apt to it. But uh, I think it's probably a little. Does the species do it? Yes, but are there certain individuals in the species that are more apt to do it? Yes, yeah. it's more that's like that. Fair. Man, yeah, that's so. <laughs> so we we've kind of covered the basic husbandry and everything. So breeding wise, mm -hmm. is it your kind of typical temperate colubrid? Drop them down, or do they need the drop? Or, or what does a year in a breeding cycle look like for carrots? Gotcha. I 
it's one where I'm always hesitant to say that it's needed because as we know, there's always going to be somebody yes. out there that's doing it without dropping them. I do it. Um, one, because I want the break. Yep. <laughs> but, but also well, that's I a think, big snake. Like that's yeah, a hefty yeah. food bill there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I drop them down to, I, I shoot for 55 degrees. If it mm-hmm. gets a hair colder, great. But 55 is where I'm, I'm gunning for. Cause I do want to make sure that they've really, settle down you know what i mean that mm-hmm. their metabolisms have, have slowed to the degree that i can get them um and i i kind of this is a species that i don't have your full answer yet on when to pair and what i mean is there's uh persinum, for example the green bush rats mm-hmm. i pair those actually in the fall and then you get eggs in the spring That's they're cool. um they're bamboos. You can pair whenever the hell you want to. Uh, Bellas, mm-hmm. Bella rats, Chaponesis. I would pair those like when they were still cooled down and I would get locks. With Carinata, I don't know if you have to wait until their first shed, if that's, you know, <laughs> whenever everything happens or not. I start pairing them like a week or really after they fed. Once they get a feeding or two in, I go ahead and start pairing and – being that I don't really get to see locks, I kind of just have to go off the way the female looks on yep. whether or not she's become gravid. Mm-hmm. So I just keep cycling the females through. Now, if they shed, especially that first shed, oh, yeah, they're instantly thrown in with the male just in case that's the trigger. But I've kind of had a a pretty good range in when they drop their eggs. So it it's hard for me to know that was the time, you, you know, that – yeah, it's that shed is when it happened, or maybe it was the second, or in between, or before the first. So I, I guess what I would tell anyone who is producing them or, or wanting to produce them, once they've had a meal or two after brewmating, if you're brewmating, go ahead and just after about two days separate. You know, because gotcha. I kind of I have a, a cycle with a lot of the um, really colubrids, ball pythons, whatever, where I will. Put them together on a Monday, separate them on a Thursday or Friday, feed them on Saturday, put them back together on Monday. And, and that's kind of, you know, how we will mm-hmm. we'll do our, our cycles through. And, you know, with them, I don't want to keep them together quite so long because of what has happened. I don't want to <laughs> yeah. encourage a female to want to take uh-huh. that, uh, take another meal because, again, they do have a faster meta- uh, metabolism. So they are moving everything through at about day three maybe day four. So after about day three, I go ahead and separate, you know, uh, females out of there. And, um, that seems to do, do what we want it to without trick. any negative, you know, consequences. Cool. So before we get to morphs and, and phenotypes, so, so we're, we're successful. We've gotten eggs. Mm-hmm. Do they ovulate and have like, is, is the cycle kind of your classic pull them out around Valentine's Day, eggs are showing mm-hmm. up in April or May, and you've got babies on the ground by July. Or it's like July is the most common. I would say I've had Carinata hatch anywhere between June and September. Okay, so I mean I, that's why I'm not a hundred percent sure on that's the trigger of when the female you know is ovulating and needs to be bred. Um, so I think there's a little bit of variance there, and it's probably I should probably keep more accurate. <laughs> you know, notations yeah. and I could give a better answer on that, but I've had such a variety on them. And it's also, I mean, if um, like the past two years I've been male light, I've not had as many males as I've needed. Mm-hmm. So it's one male sign you know, or two males cycling a number yeah. of females. And so they're being staggered over a series of weeks, which would then give me later cut yeah. clutches, earlier clutches, things like that. Um, so, um, so yeah, I would say the average is going to be probably mid to late July with me typically bringing things up in early February. Gotcha. And then classic, do you do 82 degrees or do you just hold them at room temperature? I do 80. 80? On these. Okay. Yeah, 79 to 80. I, I incubate them with corn snakes and it's fine. Gotcha. Are their eggs big? I'm yes. assuming. Yes. Yeah, yeah. They're, I mean, they're, you know, they're not a ball python big, but they're... They're a good size. You you, know, you don't get them mixed up with other eggs, you know, in the incubator. Yeah. So yeah, they're decent. Nice. Okay. And then we've already gone over getting them started and everything. So let's talk a bit about morphs. 
because I this is one where just kind of the classic black and yellow morph to me was kind of awesome. But I, oh, I've that, seen yeah. the albinos and I actually like those. And I'm not normally an albino kind of person. So what all's out there? So, well, first, I guess before we even go deep into morphs, um, what's the word that they do? You're going to know what I don't because remember, I'm, I'm the uneducated hillbilly here. <laughs> the, what, the, the color change that they go Ontogenic through. Ontogenic color change. Thank you. Because <laughs> if you are looking them up, you may have seen these at a show before. And as babies, and they look like this ugly little olive yeah. brown, you know, kind of baby poop coloration mm-hmm. uh, animal that does not seem interesting at all. But then when you, I, I can't tell you how many times I'm at a show and I'm flipping my phone around to show <laughs> what an adult looks like because they go through a change and an adult Carinata is stunning, especially yeah. those with a higher amount of yellow mm-hmm. to them. Um, cause so they go from this kind of olive color to this black and high yellow gold animal and they're gorgeous. I mean, they are yeah. gorgeous. Um, so, so you have, you know, your normals that are going to be your black and yellow. You're going to have varying degrees of high yellow. And I mean, those are wow. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. Um, I actually, you know, I, <laughs> Just started working on our collection page that I used to have on the Bartley Reptiles website. And that page is still up if anybody wants to go and poke around and, and look at a few pictures. But on the collection page on Metazotics, I think I only have maybe two or three species on there at this point, And I'm using older photographs. But I do have Carinata. And <laughs> one of our het females, uh, het teen negative albinos, is a high yellow. And you'll see what I mean. And she's not even like the premier you know, high yeah. yellow. But you'll see the difference if you hop on and take a look there. Um, but so you have high, uh, high yellow, you have T negative albinos and T positive albinos. The T negatives are going to be the ones that are the most common and they are like a highlighter yellow. Uh, it, it's oh, cool. a very, very pretty albino. Now when they hatch out, they're more of a orange, like a, like a bright orange and that kind of turn, which would be more of that olive, you know, in, in that color mm-hmm. change they're going through. But they grow into a, a very bright yellow snake that's going to have kind of pattern on the front, maybe third to half of the body. And it'll be solid colored, uh, the, the back half to back two thirds. Then the T positive is out there, which is going to be, I don't want to say that it's going to have purple highlights, but it's kind of that brownish purplish yep. that you see with a lot of T positive animals. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's a, I, I like that probably more than the T negative and not necessarily because it's prettier, but I tend to lean towards T positive animals. I, you see fewer of that mutation, you know, in the, the different, uh, different classes. So I think that that's really neat. Um, and so I really like those. And as babies, if you have an eye, you can tell a T negative from a T positive as adults, it's super easy, but they can be confused. Um, when juveniles, you also have hypos over here and that's the one that's the most commonly mislabeled. So really? th- there's a lot of people out there that think they have a hypo carinata, And in fact, they have a T positive. Um, and I do have a picture of the adult male hypo on the website that is no longer with us. Uh, <laughs> and you'll be able to see the difference between a T positive and a, and a hypo. The hypo is a... It's a very vivid yellowish, like yellow and yellowish mm-hmm. green almost. So it's not that highlighter yellow. It's out of though. It's my favorite mutation that I, I've had wow. in my possession so far. It's, it's very pretty. I've got some hats, so hopefully we'll have <laughs> we'll some production on them again soon. But um, it, it's it's very very pretty, and it again is one of the more rare over here. Um, as of right now, and it's it, maybe it's more prevalent than I think, but I see it mislabeled so often that it, it's yeah. you know I just don't really not a, too many people out there that have the the real deal. So yeah, that that brings to light is a little side note. Um, I was listening to a podcast and and they had a guest on and they were doing the whole we're talking about lines. And then it was this zoo line versus that zoo line. And meanwhile, they're the same damn snake. 
<laughs> so <laughs> drives me insane. Mm -hmm. And then we're talking about purity and everything. And, and I was I was talking with one of the professors here. He was my former student. But um, as a professor, there's few things you enjoy more and, and make you feel more fulfilled than when your student goes on and then mm -hmm. literally academically completely kicks your ass. Uh, and, uh, that's what Nicole did. And I, I called her, I got, I was listening to the podcast driving home, parked my car and I called her and was like, listen, I need you to come on to the podcast and we're going to have a great big conversation about inbreeding and lines and morphs and, and, and all this from a genetics point of view. And Nicole is, or Dr. Garrison is one of those people who can do what we were talking about with Dr. Green. Where, yeah. where she can take this highly complicated thing and present it so like a 10 year old can understand it. So that is going to be an episode probably in February um, where we're just going to do the genetics and like the realities of inbreeding, what, what an outbreeding depression is, um, why it is OK, but not OK. But it, but the morphs, like what you said, mislabeled morphs like we mm -hmm. that, that's yeah, that's just something. And then. I can't really bitch about it because I can't remember the damn morphs to save my life. Like I can remember <laughs> – I can walk through the forest and rattle off every freaking little diminutive bug, but I can't <laughs> tell you what the hell a zebra carpet python – I still don't know what a zebra carpet python is. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, so yeah, no. Uh, so you, you – back to the Carinado. Um <laughs> So the um, – you said that there were some morphs in Europe – that that, yep. that we don't have. Yeah, Do you want to kind of dive into those a little bit. So the few that I can recall, because a lot of times I'll see them, I'll think, "Oh, that's gorgeous," and it's going to be expensive, and then <laughs> I'll just go about my day. Right? Yeah. I have to wait till it's over here and, and a little mm -hmm. more affordable. So there are anneries that have been produced, oh. and I'm pretty sure we've got. Uh, I, well, actually, I, I know a young lady who's got some uh, over here. So those have made their way over now. Um, I don't think they've been produced over here yet, but I think everybody who's got them has juveniles, yearlings, uh, things mm -hmm. like that. There, um, there's leucistic that's out there. Really? Yeah. Solid white. It's out there. Giant white Karenov. Yeah. Yeah. That's gotta be insane. Yeah. Um, there's patternless, uh, which I mean, Lucy is a, yeah. a but they're different in, as far as the look there's, um, let's see. I could I can't remember if there was a scaleless or not. I could be wrong on that, but for some reason I want to feel like I've seen a scaleless. Um, there, Is there an Azanthic? If there is, that's the Annery. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. that's yep. They're going to kind of you know kind of be on that same. Yeah, they're going to look the same. Yeah, you know. Can, can you just imagine how many morphs are popping up in those snake farms? <laughs> well, it, it, they, it's, it's almost they probably like they have a handful have of individuals mating. So you already have a you know, depressed yep. gene pool, yep. I would imagine. And that's usually when the morphs start mm -hmm. popping up. But, I, yeah. I mean, there's been some, I mean, just beautiful ones. There's, when I say high yellow, I think there's different um, types. Uh, I think that some are going to be more of a, you know, line bred. And there's going to be some that I think might be a mutation itself, you know, a recessive of some sort that's called, because I've seen them called lemons. And I don't know mm -hmm. if these lemons are just a high right. Uh, I'm sorry, um, high yellow that has been line bred, or if it's some recessive trait that's popping out. Um, so yeah, there's I see them pretty frequently um, here and there that have popped up, and it's either from the UK um, or and it's usually uh, like one or two individuals in the UK that get their mm -hmm. hands on them, um, or uh, sometimes it's from China directly from China. I'm seeing individuals post, you know, with some really wicked morphs, and so there's still a lot more to come down the pipeline when it comes to different mutations of Carinata because you have to, you know, remember for every new single gene mutation how many combos does that then <laughs> open up, right? Yeah. And so there's still a lot more to happen. And really, I mean, I think th there's very little as far as two gene combos that have even yeah. taken place yet that I I've witnessed, um, you know, when it comes to Carinata. So that's just two gene. Once you start getting three gene, four gene, you know, all this mm -hmm. happening, there there's still a lot to go. And I – it's funny because you would think that a snake this size wouldn't have quite the following that it does, 
but yeah, it, it continues to to gain in popularity. And I, I mean, of all of them that we produced this year, I think I have I may be sold out completely. You know, at this point, yeah. Um, and that's again, it goes back to this is a species that people still want. Um, people are still looking for what fits and even the normals still have to your point when you said you love the way they look, when you know what it is, I've had people that I'm like, you know, I've, I've got hets and they're like, I I just want a normal to be honest with you. You know, that's what they're after. They, they want that. So, um, I think that that is a species that even though it, it does take up some room, um, it is going to continue to be popular for quite some time, uh, especially with, all the new mutations that are going to continue to it, make their yes, way over here. Yes, it seems like you cut your kind of your, your classic big. There's that big colubrid niche, which is usually dry marken or false water cobras, hmm. but it seems like a lot of people that have like I've got my dry marken, whatever Kribo indigo I want, I've got a falsy or a pear, and then like the third one that seems to kind of slide in with that group mm-hmm. with some consistency is Carinata. Uh, yeah. And then maybe right behind it would be your giant mad hogs, the Madagascar hognose snakes. Um, you know, and I feel ones. that out of those four species you named, Carinata are probably the easiest when it yeah. comes to, to taking care of. I, I mean, they, they really don't require too much. Yeah, the room temperature thing. Things. Yep. Because yeah. dry marken, in my experience, and I've now kept three of them, um, I've got black tails right here to the left of me and indigos in here right now. They're They're weird because they're – How the hell do I – it seems like they are on point until they're not, and when they're not, it takes a little bit to get them back on point. Mm -hmm. And falsies are easy, and then they're not. Like when they go off feed, I get – and when I give them – I sell them to people and people are – I usually around this time of year is when I start getting the, oh, my God, he's not eating um, (laughs) messages, which just means they're getting too cold. But if these guys, you keep them at room freaking temperature (laughs) – you know, now, now that you said that, I'm thinking like maybe I was keeping mine too hot because um, I was keeping mine probably with an ambient around 80 and uh, the, yeah. you know, the hot spot was pushing 85, 86. Yeah. 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 That'd be so, a little too much hmm. for them. I think if, if someone is setting them up in a four foot cage and giving them a hot spot of maybe 82, I think that's going to be fine for them to mm-hmm. thermoregulate. Uh, but I would try to keep the ambient really no hotter than like 75, you know, somewhere 74 seems to be perfect in that room for them. Cool. So we pretty much have covered everything we normally cover. Anything else? Just throwing it out into the ether about this species. Give them a chance guys. I I mean, if you're ready for something that has a little bit of size on it and you, you know, when we talk about the way being a colubrid keeper makes you a better keeper Mm -hmm. in general, this is a species that will do it. Um, I think it will make you a better better handler. Yeah. Because even if they're not aggressive, you still respect them and you're still going to handle them as if you don't want to be bit, right? And so – and again, I, I, you know, we talk about them being big and them being bit. But then again, I tell you, I can't remember ever being bit by one. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I handle a lot of them. You know, a lot of, and some of them are super mean, you know. Um So I would just say that this is one that if you're thinking about giving it a go, do it because they they are cool. I mean, they they're one of my favorite species that we have out here. Um, They they look cool. They're not super hard to to take care of. Um, They aren't. I don't want to say they're incredibly difficult to, to reproduce. It's you know, it's not as easy as a corn, but. You follow, you know, a little bit of the recipe, and and you should have, you know, a, a decent amount of success getting babies to start. I think I had one out of all of them <laughs> this year that that didn't take. You know, everything else, it's it's not really a problem. Um, just be careful on on where you're getting them. You know, like we yep. said at the beginning, um, if you're getting them at a show, I think most of our listeners probably have a decent eye for what tables are importers and flippers and what tables, you know, are okay. These people have worked with this animal and, you know, um, so I just, the, the knowing the number of them that come over here from the farms is is scary. So, and I don't, my fear is I don't want that to be your experience with a Carinata. Well, you also need to be real careful because if you're pulling those into a well-established collection, 
you know, you can quarantine all you want. Uh, you got things down in lungs. Unless you treat with an antibiotic, it's going to be there and it's going to be persistent even after a 90 day quarantine. And the next thing you know, you run the risk of being the vector that then gives the whole damn collection to mo- Like you don't want to, that's just a little bit more than scary. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Well, and the good news is there, there are several people in the U S that are producing these. Mm-hmm. This isn't one that is incredibly difficult to find, you know, so there's a lot of reputable names out there. Um, you know, you're, you're going to be able to find, if you want one of these, you can find a nice U S captive bred ready to go Carinata without much issue. So perfect. All righty. Well, I think we did it. I think we nailed it. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> and we're, we're just shy to two hours. So I guess we did talk. We always say that every, every time it's a, <laughs> you and me or back in the days when it was Matt, we'd be like, Oh, this was only going to be like an hour and 20 minutes. And it's, it's yeah. a good two hours though. It's probably the most Ooh, relaxing two hours of my week. There so anyway, Fine. yeah. Good relevant stuff to talk about. So. Yeah, there you are. So if you uh, want to find me and you don't know how to find me yet, um, Dr. Crawdad on Instagram, uh, Zach Loafman on Facebook. Uh, also, obviously, if you want to go more tradi- traditional routes, uh, Z Loafman at westliberty.edu. Um, always looking for grad students, uh, which you know needs to be said, and, and undergrads for that matter. Uh, and don't be afraid to, to reach out. There's been it's, – it's funny. When I have days like we started the episode where I'm like walking down the hallway parting the Red Sea with my aura, <laughs> <laughs> there, there's few things better than like checking Messenger and then someone's asking me a question about a snake. So that's that's not bad at all. Like it's fun <laughs> to keep me on my toes and everything else. So, so reach out. Um, if people want to find you, Clint, where do they find you at? Uh, on Facebook, you can either message me directly, Clint uh, Bartley, or uh, the Metazotics Facebook page. Um, if you do me- message the Metazotics page, it comes directly to my pocket as well. Um, Instagram, Metazotics LLC. Uh, check us out online at metazotics.com. Feel free to email at metazotics at gmail.com. I uh, also want to say we've had several people who have messaged us with new ideas, uh, show ideas that Zach and I have already mm-hmm. started taking notes on and uh, as well as some guest recommendations. Thank you so much for those. Please keep those coming. Um, we're going to be working on the Facebook page so that we have yes. a little more streamlined, you know, manner to communicate with everybody. Um, and I, I want to say for every one of you that have messaged about an animal and started your message with Clint, I love the podcast. That makes my day every time I get one of those messages. Yeah. It's, Me too. It's so great. Um, so please keep it coming. Uh, Zach and I are going to continue to do our very best to make the show uh, something that you guys enjoy and, uh, and that you find relevant. Uh, so please keep the feedback coming. We yep. do appreciate it. Yeah. So no matter what time of day or night it is, hope you're having a great one. See ya. See ya.